Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today a subject that we've visited uh, a couple of times before. Yes, uh, we have always uh, been accustomed to bringing you the latest news in child abuse. It's never pleasant, but it is necessary. But we're approaching it from a little different perspective today that we've not been able to do before because we have a medical professional who has substantial training in that that's going to talk to us about some things that I think you'll find very interesting and that we have not covered before. So this is not our routine child abuse show. This is uh, something uh, above and beyond. Dr. Michael Baxter will be our guest, and we'll have that episode of The Verdict when we return. My middle name is Warrior, and I try to be a chicken style warrior because they stand for unconquer and unconquerable. I just try my hardest and never give up. I am Tommy Warrior Carney, I'm a wrestler, and I am Jigsaw. Atta boy, keep going! I couldn't tell you how many times I've watched the boy be down by a point, two points, and pull the match out. Let's burn! When I grow up, I'm going to go to OSU and then go to the Olympics. Now finish it! I think that's a lot of the secret to his success is he just keeps coming. He doesn't quit. He's going to try to beat you with everything that he has. But when it's done, he always wants to hug his opponent and shake his hand. My name, Tommy, means ray of light because my dad's dad's name is Ray, and he's in heaven, and the ray of light is shining on me. It just makes me try my best and be the ray of light. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. Back to the set of The Verdict, Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today, as I indicated, we are really pleased to have Dr. Michael Baxter with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Baxter is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. He did his undergraduate, well, his undergraduate work at Southwestern Oklahoma State University in Weatherford, got his uh, DO degree uh, from Oklahoma State University. He uh, completed successfully a two-year fellowship in child abuse pediatrics. Uh, he is uh, in the Department of Pediatrics at OU. He is a fellow in the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is his first visit to the verdict. Uh, Dr. Baxter, really glad to have you. Thank you both. The field of medicine has a lot of specializations. This seems extremely specific. Is uh, you obviously couldn't have, uh, as a small child, been thinking someday I'm going to grow up and, and be a doctor studying this particular uh, thing, but how, what led you to here? What, kind of give us some background on the path. Yes, sir. Um, during medical school, um, my current mentor, Robert Block, came to Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine during our second year, did a two-hour lecture, and that was the first mm -hmm. time I was introduced to the field. Really? Uh, yeah. So it was one lecture that kind of sparked that, that the idea that this was going to be your life's work? Yes, sir. So I didn't know I wanted to be um, a child abuse pediatrician at the time, but I did know I wanted to be a pediatrician. That was my interest in going to medical school. Um, so with that lecture, it kind of prompted me to look into the field and then ultimately do um, a rotation with the University of Oklahoma during my fourth year of medical school. And then the, the rest is history, so mm -hmm. they would say. Is part of the training uh, dealing with uh, law enforcement agencies or state agencies in general? Yes, sir. So. Um, Part of the training and the fellowship, as well as just in my career, would be working with investigators, whether it's in law enforcement or child protective service workers with mm -hmm. DHS, um, and helping them assist with you know, doing the medical evaluation so I can assist them so they can look at that case. Mm -hmm. And are you called in on cases, say, all over the state or just a specific part of the state? So my job mainly is here for Tulsa County, um, meaning that the center where I work sees mostly Tulsa County kids. However, our entire team see kids from all over the state. So we have kids that come from LaFleur County or all the way from the Panhandle mm -hmm. that may be sent to the Children's Hospital and we'll do consults and see those children and help the, the child and the family and then also the investigators. 
So your practice occurs primarily at Children's Hospital in Tulsa? Um, that's my hospital practice would yes. be at the yes. Children's Hospital at St. Francis. Um, my, the majority of my clinical practice is at the Children's Advocacy Center. It's an outpatient based clinic. Yeah, talk to us about Team for Children at Risk. The Team for Children at Risk um, has been around for a while, but the, the name itself came in 2015 when we decided to consolidate a lot of different functions of what we were all doing together into one team. This would, just to kind of help clarify to the university and the college what we were doing and to the community what our team was. So there's four main components for the team for children at risk. One would be the child abuse pediatric portion, which is- Which is you. It's yeah. me and two additional child abuse pediatricians. Um, and we see children do medical evaluations and then treat that child, help the family, and then help anyone else involved. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The second aspect would be um, Fostering Hope of Tulsa, which is a separate clinic that is located on the Youth Services of Tulsa campus. And there we will see kids that have kind of any connection to the foster care system. Um, they may be in foster care, they may be in a trial reunification, meaning being placed back with the parents, and they may be um, adopted, so with a new family, or they may be back with their parents permanently. And it really is a primary care medical home designed mm -hmm. to give a coordination of care to that child to their entire um, you know, childhood. I, I suppose that in that <clears throat> uh, aspect of your work, you may be called upon from time to time to express your opinion about whether or not a child ought to be returned. Um, I try not to. I try to just help explain the medical aspects of the case mm -hmm. to the investigators. Um, and sometimes that would be with maybe a district attorney as well. Um, this would be as an expert witness, yes. either in a juvenile case or sometimes in a criminal case. Um, ultimately, it's up to the state to determine where that child's placed. Mm -hmm. I can express my concern for their health, safety, and well being in certain environments, particularly if they continue to get injuries or be at risk for neglect in that environment. Uh, one thing that has always interested me about <clears throat> your work is, is how you're able to diagnose uh, at the hospital whether or not a child has been potentially a victim of child abuse. Yes. What factors do you look at to try to come to those conclusions? Um, so this is a big part of our training and um, a, a third part of the Team for Children at Risk would be the Child Abuse Pediatric Fellowship we have. So this is where we train pediatricians to do our job. And in that, we teach them um, from medical students to residents to look at an overall history. We stress that so much in medicine, history, history, history. And to obtain that history, you look at for pediatrics, their developmental history. How old's a child and what are they doing or what should they be doing? How did the injury reportedly occur? And is that injury consistent with the history that's provided? Meaning that mechanism that is described, could that actually have happened? Mm -hmm. or the, probability or plausibility of that happening. Um, and we base this on evidence-based medicine. So we go back to literature and studies and cases and cases being reported. And that's where I ultimately can give my diagnosis and, a, and an opinion back to the team. Give some examples to our viewers about the kind of circumstance you might see existing in a child's condition that would lead you to a concern of child abuse. Yes, sir. I, I think one of the most um, common things we see would be an infant with bruising. So maybe a, a five month old who's not mobile, not really rolling over, maybe rolling over, but not definitely not cruising or crawling. And when that child has bruises on them, that's always a really big concern um, for us to be indicative of possible abuse. And so that child would need to have certain studies done, certain x-rays of their head and x-rays of their bodies and um, blood work done to kind of screen for different things. And we could ultimately find that maybe there's an underlying bleeding disorder going on, or maybe the child has an undiagnosed medical condition, but that workup still needs to happen. And then if we rule all those medical conditions out, then abuse would be the most likely cause. Um, and you can go from minor type injuries to kids who have catastrophic um, head injury or catastrophic internal injury that would all kind of play into that. Uh, I I am aware of a number of circumstances with where children were brought in with uh, spiral fractures of arms and legs and the like. Do you see that from time to time? Yeah, so spiral fractures are actually not an uncommon childhood fracture. 
and it could be from both the accidental mechanism or an abusive mechanism. Um, so another example would be um, a very common spiral fracture we see in pediatrics would be called a toddler's fracture. Um, the tibia, the big bone in the lower leg, gets a spiral fracture. It's basically kind of like a spiral staircase appearance. Mm -hmm. Common fracture that's accidental. Child can be, you know, 18 month old, 24 month old, running, plants their foot, turns, and their foot stays in one place and their body goes another, causes that torsional mechanism. Without any abuse involved. Without any abuse. And that's something that we see fairly common. Um, however, that exact same fracture in a four month old won't happen that way. That four month old can't cause that force itself to cause that. So that injury would be more consistent with an abusive mechanism. So it's not just the injury itself, you have to take in all those other factors as well. When you are brought into a, I'll call it a case for lack of a better term, is it, uh, are, are you most likely to be called in by a, an, an emergency care worker or a DHS care worker or an attending doctor? Who usually alerts somebody that we ought to have somebody look at this? Yes, sir. Uh, so we get consulted when it's at the hospital. It has to come from a medical provider. So that's either an ER doctor or another professional there who has concerns about mm -hmm. the presentation of the child. And then we would go in and help the medical team out with the treatment and care of that child. For our outpatient base, those children usually have maybe have already seen a provider that had concerns, and so they have referrals to child protective service workers and or law enforcement. And then they, those investigators schedule the child to come in, they're verbal, they'll have a forensic interview, and then afterwards we will see the child medically and then again offer opinion back to the child, age appropriately of course, and then the family and investigators. Dr. Michael Baxter is our guest. We'll have more after this break. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics a legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Set of the verdict, Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and our guest, Dr. Michael Baxter. Uh, doctor, uh, I know in the uh, Team for Children at Risk program, I think there's a fourth factor that we've not yet talked about. Would you please tell us what that is? Yes, sir. Um, the fourth part is the medical legal partnership for children. Um, this is what I think is a really important part of our team. Um, what it is, is it has an attorney who works with high risk families um, and guardians of children to help with some of the more difficult aspect, uh, aspects of what's going on. This may be housing, getting stuff done for their education, and kind of helping them with a lot of the civil proceedings that that child may need. Um, it's a wonderful way for medical providers and attorneys to work together to benefit the child and the family. Uh, what does, uh, uh, what impact does that uh, legal person have at the time you first see the child? first time the child is brought in? 
So when I'm seeing them from the child abuse pediatric standpoint, they're not really involved then. Okay. This would be further down the road or hopefully, ideally, before it gets to that point, they're able to intervene and provide services to these, this family as a preventive mechanism to prevent child maltreatment, to prevent those high risk stressful situations from occurring. Um, so that attorney really is hoping, and my hope is working with the higher risk families to prevent child maltreatment, yeah. just as much as helping with families that sure. may have experienced it. Uh, about how many children uh, in the Tulsa area do you see in a year? Uh, Annually, our team has seen between about 600 to 900 kids a year. It just depends on year to year. Um, there's wow. some variation. Um, and most of those are from Tulsa County? The majority are from Tulsa County, but again, we see kids from any county that may come to the Children's Hospital or if they're referred from another county for us to evaluate them. So the mis that must mean there's thousands across the state? There are thousands across the state, and Oklahoma is one of the states that has the highest, higher rates of child maltreatment when you look across all the states mm -hmm. nationwide. We also have a fairly high rate of kids that you know, have been in foster care or in and out of foster care as well. Um, and those are all things that statewide that need to be addressed and, and how we help these families. Again, the prevention part for pediatrics is the most important from getting to that stage. You must have a sense of why Oklahoma is so much higher than other states per capita in this type type of event, what do you think it is? Uh, multifactorial, I think that there, um, we as a state do not provide enough early childhood opportunities for families. So some of these high risk families, single parents who need appropriate daycare so that they can work. So they're not leaving these children maybe in unsafe environments. Um, starting public education earlier, getting these kids high quality public education, three or four or five, you know, for me five is a little bit too late. We need yeah. to start earlier. Um, so working with those services, I think, is key. And then working with providing um, health care across the board for some of these higher risk families. You know, maybe they don't qualify for um, sooner care or the Medicaid, but they don't really make enough to get their kids in routinely. If there ultimately is a legal proceeding, are you brought in to testify occasionally? I am. I've been an expert witness all across the state um, as uh, to help explain to the finder of fact so to speak, the judge or the jury, the medical aspects of the case. Um, one thing our team does with our training is we're able to keep other medical providers out of the courtroom. So the ER doctor, the neurosurgeon, the orthopedic surgeon may not have to go in mm -hmm. because we're able to go in and testify to that medical record and explain that to the jury or the judge as needed. And are you under cross-examination too in those cases? Yes, sir. <laughs> That's yeah. always fun, isn't yeah. it? Uh, it, it is. Uh, for me, I have always just viewed it as I'm there to help make everything clearer. So anytime there's questions that need to come up, I think they should be addressed appropriately. Um, but yes, cross-examination is, is always a little taxing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many cases a year on average would you uh, testify in? I testify somewhere between 30 and 45 times a year. It depends on kind of what hap what's going on with the state. So that's a big part of the... You know, that's a big uh, draw on your time. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, so it will take, um, t for just a simple hearing, maybe a preliminary hearing, mm -hmm. would be two hours out of my day. Mm -hmm. um, a jury trial is going to be four to six hours mm -hmm. out of my day, and that's not counting prep time with the attorney who's called me um, to testify. Like a lot of professionals who deal in these, in these uh, situations that we all wish didn't occur to begin with, how do you how do you get away with it? How, you know, when you're away from the, your office, and how do you how do you get rid of the stress that must follow you around uh, throughout much of your working day? I, I love that question. So <laughs> one thing that has been near and dear to my heart for the past few years is talking about secondary traumatic stress and how it impacts those of us in this field um, for anyone in child maltreatment. So yeah. law enforcement, CPS workers, um, and so part of that is talking about the risk for burnout with compassion fatigue. And so I, my team and I have actually done a, a, a program to understand that aspects, and then we've kind of developed wellness programs. Oh, what have you learned? Um, so we went through an entire workbook and we talked about the different terminology. So secondary traumatic stress is the stress that child has experienced as primary stress or primary trauma is mm -hmm. now impacting me. And so when I go home, I will be thinking about that. It leads to compassion fatigue. Basically, I see some of the worst of the worst things that happen to children. So if I see maybe what you all may consider 
a traumatic injury in a child, I'll be like, that's nothing. I saw a kid worse last week. So that's kind of a dangerous aspect. Um, and then all that would lead to burnout or mm -hmm. potential for burnout. Um, and then there's also compassion satisfaction. So these are the kids that we see in the families we see that we really have that impact and provide them what they need. And we see those kids thrive and do well. Um, so all of that kind of plays into it. And mm -hmm. so then with our, my wellness program, I love soccer. So I'm an, mm -hmm. I watch it, I play it. Um, and then I also do some running week to week. And then of course I have a very strict um, Friday night family movie night. Uh, <clears throat> how many physicians are there on your, your team? Yes. Uh, there's currently three child abuse pediatricians. One is our newest faculty. She just finished her fellowship with us in March and started April That's 1st. That's the fellowship you completed as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so she finished her fellowship and is the newest faculty member. So there's three child abuse pediatricians here. In Star Tulsa? Yes, sir. Oh. Starting in July, we will have two new fellows um, starting with us for a three-year training program that we will train them as well. So it's a three-year commitment in that fellowship program to even uh, be qualified to do what you do. Yeah. So it's four years of medical school, right. three years of residency, mm -hmm. three more years of fellowship. So it's a huge commitment for someone to want to do this in this field. What about Oklahoma City, if you know? What are their numbers of uh, folks that do what you do? They, they currently have two board-certified child abuse pediatricians. One is primarily ER-based, the other one is more outpatient-based. Um, I believe they're getting a third, which I hope they are because they need it. Um, their system's a little bit different. A lot of their cases go through the emergency room, so all the pediatric emergency room doctors there have a level of experience with child maltreatment that maybe not all ER doctors have. Mm -hmm. But it's not to the level of what you guys have after you've gone through the fellowship. They're, correct, the pediatric emergency room doctors don't have yeah. that same training. That besides the one that's there, yeah. um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Brown, he, he does have a similar type training. He didn't do the fellowship, but he kind of got grandfathered in just due to his length in practice. Mm. And people at home that might be watching this show and they go, I wish I could do something. What, what, do, you, what do you offer? What, uh, what can they be doing that might help the situation? Um, so I think making, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to get involved. There's different organizations that you can become involved in, um, like the court appointed special advocate. So you could go and just be there and be there for that child or that family throughout the process. It's and you don't have to be a lawyer to be a CASA. No, sir, you just don't. Just an interested, trained citizen. Correct, so you go through a training and you can do that. Um, you can get involved in other aspects of child maltreatment, so maybe volunteering at different shelters that can help these families. Um, and I think making phone calls to those in the state making some of the decisions that are directly impacting our children would be mm -hmm. another key thing. Is there legislation pending um, in this year or in previous years that you think is, is important to help you in your work? Um, none currently that I know of right mm -hmm. now. Um, I do feel that our state system, the way we deal with child maltreatment is outdated. Mm -hmm. It was designed before this specialty existed and could probably use some reworking at the state legislature legislative level. So I would hope that we could do that with some of the state agencies that are in charge of kind of directing that. Well, you're to be commended for dedicating your professional life to helping those that can't help themselves. And uh, we wanted to do this show with you because of your commitment. And uh, you have the gratitude from both Nick and me for what you're doing. Well, I thank you both gentlemen for yeah. allowing me to come here and, and talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. Well, and we appreciate OU Medicine and all the work that you and your other doctors do. Please pass along our appreciation. Absolutely, sir. Kent and I'll have a final word when we get back. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at StopsWithMe.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 
2-3 child. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children coming from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we try to do with these kids. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Cornette and Kenton Myers wrapping up a show with Dr. Michael Baxter of OU Medicine. Uh, uh, he works at the facility here in Tulsa and deals with some really tough situations. Yes, I, I was very serious about our commendation to him uh, because I'm, I'm aware of the kind of things he has to face daily mm -hmm. and uh, how he uh, is able to work that off with soccer <laughs> and running. I think that's commendable and probably necessary and I know uh, we are very grateful to have him. Well, it crossed my mind that some of our viewers might want to know how they can help. And uh, there is a website, OUTulsaGives.com, that could lead you to uh, some programs that could benefit the young people involved here. And, of course, there's the general website for OU.edu slash Tulsa, where Dr. Baxter uh, works out of. And we have a website. We'd love to see you log on to that website and tell us about a guest you'd like to see or an additional subject you'd like to see covered. That's TheVerdict.tv. That's going to do it for now. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week right here on The Verdict.